Thanks, Andrew. Leadership is quite a fraught term, you know, because um, you'll often hear it said, particularly in politics, um, just show some leadership, which is essentially a way of saying, well, don't do what the people want, do what the elites want, right? Or, as I read in this morning's paper in the Finn, uh, Jim, um, the Treasurer, what's his name, Jim? <laughs> Chalmers, was uh, be being asked to uh, show a bit of leadership. And, of course, you know, same thing. They want him to do something that's unpopular, but somehow that's leadership. Gosh, Goff was crashed through a crash. People often say, think big. So it's a, a very coloured term. In, uh, in normal situations, Google tells me there are something like 15,000 books written on leadership and many hundreds of articles each year. But political leadership, of course, is quite a different category. In fact, um, that's why I think today I've been asked to talk about l political leadership and the lessons we can learn from it. And um, I think there are some very important things that come through, even though I think good leaders are hard to find. Uh, in my time, and that includes being state and federal president, uh, I've met, I've had dealings with something like 11 prime ministers and over 40 state premiers and that's not to mention some of the leaders I've met offshore. So, in a sense, you've been able to see them as they are. It's um, all good leaders are different. I mean, if you look, think of Mahatma Gandhi or um, um, Martin Luther King, even Nelson Mandela, whom I did meet, um, they, they all had very different socio-cultural contexts in which they operated and succeeded. Uh, so I think... It's a very difficult subject to analyse in many ways. It, it's sometimes said that leadership is an art, not a science. Now, I don't know that... Um, I, that I think that is particularly so in politics because it's such a precarious and unpredictable business. They also say that people... that leaders are born and not made. Well, that certainly isn't the case in some political leaders. If you think of Bill Clinton, who was born after his father died, his mother was an alcoholic, she married three times. They didn't have two bobs to rub together, as we would say. And then you think of Abe Lincoln, who was uh, born in a log cabin and was self-educated. So, to me, uh, the, the lesson really is that leadership is much more likely to be a product of the environment. In other words, um, if you think about what you learn growing up, listening, thinking, planning, drawing on lived life experiences, these are the things that I think ultimately lead to su success. It's why in prime ministers in politics a long time before becoming number one are usually much more successful. I mean, both Keating and Howard were in the parliament for over 20 years before they became prime minister. And I think that, that shows that sense of having seen it all, having learnt from other people's failures, of, realising what works and what doesn't. But fundamentally, I think the key to success, successful stewardship is understanding economics. And both Howard and Keating had t good long terms as treasurers, uh, would have learned a lot from seeing what worked and what didn't, and being just generally immersed in political issues. And I think that's the key to it, that you're comfortable that you understand it all. And I think in recent years that hasn't been the case. Uh, if you think about Rudd, he might have had some theoretical understandings about issues. Gillard would, have, would not have had very many at all. Both Goff and Tony Abbott basically eschewed economics, and I think that showed as well. Anthony Blythe was... Uh, Andrew, uh, <laughs> Andrew uh, was kind enough to refer me to a book by Anthony Selden, who's the doyen of British political biographers. And in his latest book on Theresa May, he says this, she came to office knowing little about economics, which prevented her from understanding better the complexities involved. She understood little about government, including the powers and limitations of her office, how to make cabinet government and the civil service work for her, and how to advocate and persuade. These skills were not optional extras for the task in hand. Now, that's a devastating indictment of a Prime Minister completely out of her depth, but... I think in some ways you can look back over our recent 10 years or more and see some of those shortcomings 
in the leaders that we've had. Another thing which I think is very important is a connection with the party. And um, Rudd, Turnbull, Hewson, Gorton all prided themselves on being party outsiders. And yet uh, I think that proved to be a weakness, not a strength for all of them. John Howard had been a vice president in New South Wales and he understood the critical importance of keeping the party on side and understanding its concerns. So it's not just a mechanical thing of just making sure they don't get out of line, it's mixing with people who are out there in the real world and do have issues that uh, they want addressed. So I think that was probably another learning experience for him. Doris Kearns Goodwin, uh, I hope you all know who she is, but she's a renowned American political historian. And she says the vital qualities of leadership, she's talking political leadership, are intelligence, energy, empathy, verbal and written skills, and skills in dealing with people. So to those, I would add a fierce ambition, which I think Andrew Peacock lacked, but John Howard certainly had in spades. Plus perseverance, so being in the wilderness, uh, Menzies, Howard, looks like Josh Frydenberg for the time being, uh, and then having a strong work ethic. And I think there are a lot of attributes that you can find in successful leaders, even though there aren't that many of them. John Howard also had a memory like an elephant, which um, I think stood him in very good stead. I never saw him using speech notes. It was all up here, but it just flowed and it was very persuasive. Uh, it wasn't Obama-like oratory, but they were words that counted. And I think we've already had reference to this, but I think it's probably some of the most powerful and enduring words ever uttered in public life in Australia were spoken in the heat of battle during the 2001 election campaign. We will decide who comes to this country. Now, I heard Penny's assessment of that uh, proposition, but I think most Australians understood that to mean we don't simply do what other people want us to do. We are a government. We're elected to make the decisions, and we will. So leadership is not just about achieving outcomes. It's taking people with you, as John Howard did, to get everyone a fair go in Cabinet, and as a result, there were very few leaks in my time. Great leaders are judged by their character and they inspire others through integrity displayed in their actions and words. Tony Abbott's uh, quote was also mentioned today, I think by Peter Dutton, about character, convictions and courage. And I'll just give you one example of, of character. Uh, this was well before John Howard became leader and it was back in the early 90s. I was a shadow minister for social security and I'd been to New Zealand and I came up with some clever little stunt or formula and uh, one day in the newspapers reported that John Howard had this idea and I didn't sort of think anything more about it. How did that happen, you know? And then suddenly I got a letter from him saying, Richard, uh, the newspapers wrongly reported that I hadn't come up with this idea, it was yours. And I thought, I, I can't imagine anyone else having done that. But he did. And to me, that was a great mark of character for him. He could have asked one of his people to pass on the message or something, or he might have just said nothing about it and claimed the credit. But he didn't. So I thought that was very impressive. And I think, um, in many ways, another great example of character and political courage was um, during the Telstra privatisation debates as you may recall, two of my best friends were Brian Harradine and Mel Colston. So it was my job to cultivate them on a daily basis. They were very different, as I'm sure you understand. But Colston was uh, a very odd figure. I mean, all he ever wanted to talk about was could we get a job for his son. Uh, but he was also very sensitive about some issues, like his travel expenses, right? And... <laughs> Possibly, possibly for good reason. And Labor started running this campaign that it was immoral for us to take his vote. Now, th now they didn't for a moment say they wouldn't take his vote, but it became quite an issue in the media. And John, to his great credit, said, well, you know, he is a bit on the nose, so I won't take his vote. Now, you could say that uh, caused us a bit of pain down the track when we didn't get him to vote with us on the second round of privatisations, but that was almost heroic to put that sort of principle ahead of the uh, likely political outcome. So 
I thought um, there were two, two very good examples of, um, of that. The, the other thing I should say in terms of, um, of political courage, the ABC, um, as you may recall, uh, if you've been around long enough, uh, was giving us a very hard time on the Iraq war and particularly the AM program. So I put in about, uh, I don't know, 68 or something. <laughs> and, of course, no-one could believe that um, I hadn't written all these questions myself, but I had. And uh, we deliberately didn't go near the department because we knew what would happen if we did. And throughout all of that, and I got uh, belted by, I think, Michelle Grattan kept calling me the Terminator and this sort of thing. <laughs> um, but John never said a word. Now, I thought, in terms of political handling, that was very good. Uh, I think the party room was very supportive, but uh, nonetheless, John could easily have said, well, hang on, don't go too far, you know, my good mate's the chairman, this sort of thing, but he didn't. So, again, in a personal sense, I, I appreciated that as a tacit support in, in, a, in a very important matter. The other thing I'd say about the way leadership's often portrayed is people talk about what George Bush dismissively described as the vision thing. And the reality is that visionaries don't have a great track record. I think Hitler probably thought he was a visionary and I'm sure Julius Caesar and Napoleon thought they were too. But it ended badly for all of them and for the obvious reason that it's not your vision that counts, it's what the people out there think. And that's why John got um, howled down when he talked about being relaxed and comfortable. Howls of derision from the media, the... the line for them was this was a classic example of a bloke who's got no idea of vision. But the reality was that it did strike a chord with Middle Australia. They were sick of being preached to and they simply wanted to be understood and appreciated. So this is how you read the electorate. This is how politics should work, not just going out there and stating your vision, whatever that might be. Another thing about leadership is longevity doesn't necessarily guarantee you anything. Angela Merkel was Chancellor for 16 years. Now, some would say she was barely minding the shop, but others often referred to her as the de facto leader of the EU. But the reality was, when you think about the alternatives, there wasn't much to offer. Berlusconi, uh, Sarkozy, Hollande. <laughs> you, know, you couldn't get much worse than that trio. And yet, and I think really she was much more concerned about Germany first and uh, making sure they prospered. So a low exchange rate with the euro suited them just fine. She didn't really care much, so it seemed, about uh, Greece. So Greece had to go through 10 years of agony as a result of that. So I come back to my proposition that good leaders are hard to find. And I think in some ways um, Howard is still... The, the gold standard for this. And, and I ask myself why. I mean, I, we used to meet every day in Canberra, every morning when we were sitting. So I did have the opportunity to watch him in action a fair bit. And there was a certain calmness about him. I mean, most of us swear a bit. I try not to, but, you know, can't help it really sometimes. But I never heard him swear or lose his temper. And I think, again, his long experience solidified into political wisdom. He'd seen it all and he instinctively knew the right response. And I, I think that's very important in politics to have an instinctive feel for things. It comes from conviction in many respects. And I, and I always remember with Tampa, um, Kim Beasley, whom I think we all admired as a person, and uh, Bob Hawke might be right, he might have been OK if he'd been Prime Minister, but Kim sort of flip-flopped on the issue and that was fatal. And it was in part because he didn't really have an instinctive feel for what should happen. It was more a matter of, well, you know, what's the party think or where do we stand on this? And, and you get slaughtered if that's where you come from. John also had a very good sense of humour. Uh, he never let his ego take over. He was always extremely patient and courteous. Uh, you'd like to think you can take those things for granted, but I'm sure we all know many examples of the opposite. The other good thing about him was that he was upfront about his intentions. And someone mentioned earlier this morning about how um, Keating, how we had supported some things that Labor did, and I think particularly in privatisations. 
and Keating went to the election saying they had no intention of privatising the Commonwealth Bank and Qantas, and in five minutes after getting back in, they legislated for it. But even worse, he said that he would certainly not ever repeal the LAW law tax cuts. And of course, once again, gets back, feels a little differently, and uh, the media didn't really object to it all. But what John did with the GST, because he'd always said never ever, he was quite upfront. He said, well, I'm not going to just change my mind and suddenly try and legislate for it. I'll take this to the people and I'll put it attached to it a very important compensation package and I'll stand or fall on it. Now, I think one of the factors that helped us was that we did have a large majority because we lost, I don't know, what was it, 15 seats or something, wasn't it? And uh, most parties don't have the luxury of 15 seats these days. So uh, there was a bit of a political cushion, but nonetheless, it was exactly the right thing to do. You, you go out there, you show people the ultimate in political transparency, and they reward you for it. Not, not everyone, obviously, but some of them probably held their nose while they voted for it. In fact, I remember seeing uh, some research which said, people said, well, why on earth is he wanting to put up a new tax? That doesn't work for us. And they said, well, you know, maybe he thinks it's good for the country. Now, so there were enough people who voted for it to suggest to you that they did recognise that this was a very important change in the taxation system. So if we just look back on um, outstanding leaders in other places, I think there have been very few in the US. The only two I could think of offhand would be Clinton, who I think was a political genius, even though he was a bit flawed in other respects. Uh, and and I, I, got to, I met him a number of times. He addressed Cabinet one time too, didn't he? And there was a charisma about him. I saw him at a, an arts function in, a, in Los Angeles a couple of years ago and the old magic was still there. As soon as he got to his feet, they were cheering from the rafters. So there was something special about Clinton as a leader. And again, I think he, he learnt the lesson from the midterms. He moved to the centre and it worked. The other person, of course, is Reagan. And I think Reagan's reputation has only been enhanced as the years have gone by. Uh, and, you know, changes to the tax system. I read a fascinating book called The Pope and the President. Have you ever read it? Yeah? The Pope, Prime Minister and the President. No, just The Pope and the President. It's, it's about well, you JP. <laughs> There's another... <laughs> uh, uh, well, this is... Sorry, this is more about religion, actually. <laughs> I, I don't know that Margaret was a fervent Catholic, but anyway... <laughs> Uh, the, the Pope, and, and Reagan wasn't a Catholic either, but you would, couldn't believe how many times they spoke together and how many times they discussed moral issues. Uh, I just found it fascinating. I, and this is sort of unknown to the public, but that's the real Reagan. And I admired him tremendously after I'd read it. And when I read John's other one, I'll read, probably admire him <laughs> even more. <laughs> um, we've heard about events, dear boy, events, and I think that's, that is perfect and... Of course, what John said after the Port Arthur massacre is the classic example. He'd only been in government for about eight weeks when that occurred and it could have gone every which way. Certainly could have got out of control very easily. But not only did he come up with the right solution, but he held his nerve. And that's quite unusual in politics. Um, most people are driven by what they read. And Thatcher said she never read the newspapers. Now, I don't quite believe it, but... I know what she meant. She really didn't take any notice of their advice because it was easily given and uh, not always catering for your best interests. So I think that was probably one of the great highlights of uh, John Howard's career because, as we've already canvassed, gun control was the ultimate test for a Liberal leader dealing with the National Party and he managed to keep uh, their leaders on side. And again... You know, we were very fortunate. Uh, Tim and I went to school with Tim Fisher. He used to talk to me a lot about <laughs> everything. But, um, you know, Tim Fisher and John Anderson, you couldn't get better quality people. And this is where character comes in. You don't have to worry about, you know, are they a bit shady or is he, you know, is he selling his piggery next week or the week after? Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and I thought that made a, a big difference to the, the admiration that people have for you and their willingness to go along with you. Um, Margaret Thatcher I met a number of times. I have to say she was probably in her dotage, but I 
never forget a very small lunch that John and I attended with her. There only about 10 or 12 people there. Peter Reith was there, actually, wasn't he? And uh, I thought this was funny. It's not exactly a question of leadership, but John was asked uh, how he would define his political stance, and he said that um, he was a social conservative. Well, she almost <laughs> went bananas and she said, I'm not, I'm a real conservative. <laughs> and what she really meant was she thought John was saying, I'm a party boy, you know, I'm a social conservative. <laughs> uh, but so she, to the very end, I think, she just had very strong views and they were fundamentally very right. Um, she projected strength. Remember, you know, the lady is not for turning and Tina, there is no alternative. So she made an art form out of this, the Iron Lady. The Russians coined the phrase, but she <laughs> revelled in it. And I saw a, a I think it was a, it might have been a two-part series, but I only saw the first part on the ABC recently, Reagan and Thatcher together. And it was fascinating. He, he deferred to her every time. She did all the talking. And in many ways, people was learning from her, I suspect. But again, she was just that sort of standout person, almost impossible to argue with, but fundamentally, as we would say, on the right track. And uh, I think um, she's probably the, the absolute standout. In fact, if you look at the um, 13 Conservative Prime Ministers in the 20th century, she was the only one that you would say was right of centre. And the same goes for the three Conservative Prime Ministers have been this century. So she was quite unusual in that sense because that's the British way. I mean, if you remember Butskellism, uh, they almost wanted to merge the two major parties at times. But uh, no, she had a very, very different view of the world. Now, we all know if you lived in the North, you probably didn't appreciate it as much because there were a lot of job cuts that went, particularly in the mining sector. But I think most people look back and said, she pretty much got it right. And what I noticed when I was in London was that both Blair and Brown wanted to co-opt her. So they never changed anything she did and they wanted to be photographed with her and they invited her into Downing Street. So these weren't people who were saying, God, you know, you were hopeless or you didn't understand what was good for Britain. They fundamentally were admitting that she, she'd done the right thing. And she did. She transformed the, the British economy as a result, made it much more competitive and much more prosperous. Um, Cameron, Blair and Brown I did come across with some frequency and of course Blair had Clinton-like star power. Um, he was amazingly charismatic in many ways. Um, but And he had this light touch about him. He could ad-lib spectacularly well. I'm not sure what you would think about his greatest achievements politically and I'd probably say the same thing about David Cameron who was very good on the politics of things. I mean, I don't mean left or right, but I mean the way he could handle things. I saw him debating David Davis for the leadership and he spoke for over an hour without notes, just walked up and down the stage. Very impressive. And same in question time. He could handle himself very well. But in terms of outcomes and achievements, I, can't, I don't know. But to me, there wasn't much there. Gordon Brown was <laughs> a very... Very different individual. I mean, he was he was very dour, but he seemed to have a chip on his shoulder. When you talked to him, he really couldn't look you straight in the eye. He only had one, of course, but uh, nonetheless, you know, he'd find looking look at his watch or looking over his shoulder. And it wasn't just me. I noticed him all the time. He seemed very uneasy wherever he was almost. He probably wanted to get back to his books. You know, there were these stories about how he'd be sending emails out throughout the, the night. So all these public servants being woken up at 2, 3 and 4 in the morning. Uh, but I'm not sure that really helped things very much because it certainly didn't make his public persona very attractive and it probably deprived him of sleep and made him a bit grumpy as well. So um, I think um, the thing I remember about Gordon actually was um, when John was fighting for his life or at least his seat in 2007 with the federal election, it was on the same date as Chogham was in... Kampala in Uganda. So uh, I was very kindly invited to lead the delegation and I spent an evening sitting next to Stephen Harper and uh, 
he was one of the, the great Prime Ministers, I think, in the 20th century, nearly 10 years in office. But very sensible, very down to earth, you know, you could talk about anything, and he liked talking about politics. And I think that's part of the secret of success, that you enjoy what you're doing. You're not just there because it's, you know, publicity or whatever it is. Uh, but Gordon, on, that, on the night of the federal election, was a result of coming in, he kept pestering me about whether Rudd had won yet. And, and I worked out the reason he, he wanted to know was that he thought that as soon as Rudd was declared the winner, I'd have to change my attitude to the climate change issue. And, and I'd talked to Helen Clark about this and we both took the view that Australia should do its bit, but it shouldn't be out of line, it shouldn't be somehow a world leader, you know, bit of vision. Um, we do, do our bit. And, uh, of course... You know, Gordon was almost transparent and, and I thought quite naive to pursue that line. But Helen Clark's probably a good example to finish on for this part. I do want to say a bit about um, succession planning. But um, Helen Clark, in the lead-up to her first and successful election, she had an approval rating of about 4%. When she got there, she, to me anyway, she moved much more to the centre and as a result went on to a pretty successful career. And I think uh, there's a lesson there, particularly for Labor leaders, because if you look at uh, Australian politics since the Second World War and put Goff's three years aside, everyone's been right of centre, including Paul Keating. And to me, that is how you win elections. So if I just say a few words about leadership succession, so-called failure to manage... Um, when I think about how John Howard got there, it wasn't managed. <laughs> it was uh, Hewson resigned and then Alexander had six months and I think he came to the view that it probably wasn't going to work out as we would like. So John was essentially the last man standing. Now, to me, the only crisis would have been if he'd said no, but I don't think there was ever any risk of that happening, but thank heavens. <laughs> but again, um, leadership succession is much more talked about in the private sector where these things are managed by the board, they decide who, who they elect as chairman, they decide who they appoint as a CEO. Politics just doesn't work that way. Very few prime ministers contemplate succession and I suspect none have a plan for it except perhaps Robert Menzies who finally gave the game away in his 70s leaving Harold Holt, his long-serving and loyal treasurer as his obvious replacement. Menzies remains the only Prime Minister to have voluntarily stepped aside at a time of his choosing. So there's no party involvement. I can tell you that from being Federal President, that uh, when Tony Abbott was, um, I think, brutally ejected in favour of Turnbull, um, no-one ever asked our views, and even if we had, we probably wouldn't want to volunteer anything, and, and no-one would have taken any notice anyway because succession is entirely the responsibility of the parliamentary party. They don't need free advice. They can make up their own minds. As John rightly said, it should always only be the decision of the parliamentary party who should be the next leader. So we've never contemplated going down the path that Labor go down on this, here and in the UK. And they certainly don't want what they call in, in Britain coronations, or we might uh, call anointments, uh, they don't want a stitched-up deal. Labor's very good at stitched-up deals, particularly if you want a safe seat. Andrew Charlton didn't work out as quite as well for Christina Keneally, but that's the way they do business. We don't do that. And certainly when it comes to leadership, uh, they almost self-select. I mean, in the private sector, if you trail your coat, remember David Morgan made it pretty clear he wanted to be chairman of BHP. Well, I think that was a death knell for him. He never got it. But... When it comes to politics, the media is all over who the likely contenders are, so there's no real secrets about possibilities, but ultimately, again, it's not a matter for anyone else but the politicians themselves. Um, I won't go on about p political regime change with uh, Turnbull, but um, I certainly wasn't happy with the way that came about. Um, Labor actually is a, another good example of doing it quietly, when it was pretty obvious that um, Fraser would probably beat Bill Hayden in 1983, 
they changed their leader on the very day that he called the election. And it worked like a charm because Bob Hawke was always available, as we know, but uh, until Bill was persuaded by people like John Button, uh, it wasn't going to happen. But that was a, probably one example of a seamless transition, and there are very few of those in my experience. So, look, I don't want to go on for much longer, but um, I'd simply want to end up saying that, because um, you kept asking me to say a few words about this. This is about whether John Howard should have stood down, right, in favour of Peter Costello. Oh, we can stop there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm almost happy to do that, because I think, to me, uh, I did. Sp I was out of the country, but I did speak to a number of colleagues, and I think there were reservations about a changeover, and there was also, I think, a very strong sense of loyalty to John for what he'd done. So uh, I never had any complaints about the way that played out. But uh, I just finished by saying, uh, what you do need in politics is a love of the game. Uh, John loved every minute of it. I used to say that he would have done the job for nothing. I don't, if you'd asked him, he probably didn't know what the salary was. <laughs> but he, he was the last one to leave. He'd shake everyone's hand. You'd go in for a bit of a discussion about a policy issue, he'd always want to have a bit of a chat about the politics afterwards. So that's total immersion, and I think that's what you need in a leader, apart from all those other myriad characteristics I've, and qualities I hope I've uh, canvassed. But all I can end up saying is this. There, there's a lot of luck in politics, and my great good fortune was to be there during the Howard ascendancy. No one else could have done it better. All right, that's it.